21 years ago, a gaming console changed the world. This is the story of the Sony PlayStation 2 and how it pioneered the 21st century's most important pop medium, the modern video game. With the 3D revolution of the mid-1990s, games were becoming something new. Console games in particular were emerging as a new fusion between the arcade and the cinema. Unlike their PC brethren, console games could be enjoyed as something less menu-heavy and keyboard-bound. At a time when the majority of movies, TV, and music at home were consumed not in the computer room but the living room, Console games suddenly had the potential to revolutionize gaming beyond its niche origins. And they could do so without losing what made them special. This followed a period in the early 90s when Hollywood movies like Terminator 2, Jurassic Park, and The Abyss popularized a new computer-generated form of 3D imagery, or CGI. Powered by the technology of a firm called Silicon Graphics, the so-called fifth generation of games produced the first real-time rendered 3D consoles like the original PlayStation and the Nintendo 64 on the back of the same technology that had been used in these movies. Sony's first console was itself important and groundbreaking. Its creator, Ken Kutaragi, split the workload across multiple processors, but just as importantly, the PS1 utilized CD quality sound. This was not only a specialized gaming system, but a CD player. And Sony's connections and experience as a music company were vital to how they approached getting developers, and crucially, to how they conceptualized games generally. Sony elevated the game designer to the status of artist rather than mere programmer or technician, and they redefined the very concept of a video game, not as a toy or a curio, but as computer entertainment. Everything that PS1 did set the stage for what would become the single most important console ever released, the PlayStation 2. The PlayStation 2 was so groundbreaking and historic that it was considered dangerous. Exporting the machine required a special permit from the Tokyo Trade Ministry, because technically its technology could be repurposed by the likes of Saddam Hussein for military use. This was still an era in the wake of the so-called multimedia revolution in the early 90s, the point at which PCs first became more than mere glorified word processors. But even though special purpose accessories like 3D accelerators made high-end gaming look and play better than any console, even the best home computers at the turn of the 21st century were still primarily designed to run not dynamic applications with lots of data like games or science software, but static applications like a word processor or a spreadsheet. PlayStation 2 was a new kind of futuristic hardware specialized around nothing but running dynamic software. But what truly made it revolutionary was, by including DVD playback and putting games on the DVD disc, the PS2 integrated music, video, and gaming onto a single platform out of the box at a reasonable price point for the first time in history. Today there is no such thing as movies, music, or video games, really. In our digital future, there is only content. The PS2 was way ahead of the curve on this, and by putting movies and games onto the same format, the DVD, for the first time, just in how it was designed, the PS2 was closing the gap completely between movies and games. Development on the PS2 began with the debut of the PS1 in late 1994. Intimately involved were former designers from the company that gave Nintendo its Super FX chip for the SNES, Argonaut Games. This had made possible an early 3D game, the classic Star Fox. As the PS1 and its rival, the Nintendo 64, ushered in the first era of real-time 3D, 
What had previously only been possible as specialized arcade cabinets now entered the living room, but many, even most games on the PS1 still featured elements in 2D. After all, it was a big leap to make for developers with no prior experience to make 3D assets. This meant companies like Square could create the 3D visuals seen in their hugely successful and influential Final Fantasy VII by directly hiring specialists from the movie industry. But even with the right personnel, the PS1 had its limitations. Nintendo 64 games dealt with their system shortcomings by typically utilizing a deformed, cartoony style. But Sony games were establishing a brand of realism. The PS2 was designed to truly bring the medium into the 3D age. The PlayStation 2 was given the properties of something like the special hardware used by scientists to generate real-time experimental simulations. That's why some worried it could be dangerous in the wrong hands. In every prior era of gaming, effects and environments past a certain point were staged. The PS2, meanwhile, could take that movie set and all but bring it to life. That was because the console's games not only looked nice, they could use sophisticated AI, and the way the PS2 was built allows for multiple processes to run in parallel. Every task gets broken down procedurally into subtasks and crunched by the system's components all at once. This was called, at the time, microprogrammability. Now, all of the 6th gen consoles were designed along somewhat similar lines, it's true. But the PS2, unlike the Sega Saturn back during the days of the PS1, actually benefited from being the first machine released. The PS2 is maybe one of the boldest leaps forward in gaming history, and this had to do with something more than graphics or sheer hardware. The creativity of its early developers reflected the excitement in the air for this new and powerful machine. One launch game, Kessin, brought fully 3D real-time wargaming to consoles for the first time. None of the launch titles were very good, mind you, reflecting the still shaky grasp of most developers on the PS2's hardware, but before long, some truly historic games were establishing the console as something completely revolutionary, and in the meantime, backwards compatibility kept PS1 games relevant for years. I still remember getting the console at launch. My first games for it were Tekken Tag Tournament, Orphan, Scion of Sorcery, and Eternal Ring. Tekken had a huge bar to clear, considering this was hot on the heels of Tekken 3. It may not be nearly as well remembered as its predecessor today, but at the time it was unbelievably beautiful. I remember watching cutscenes in the game just staring in total amazement at how much better not only characters looked, but how much more expressive the devs could be with atmosphere and even pseudo-photorealistic effects. It sounds silly today, but back then, stuff like this, the game's intro cinematic, looked next to lifelike. And more importantly, the characters still looked basically the same once you actually started playing. This cutscene emphasizes a lot of little details and stuff like faces and flowing jackets because this was really the first time console games could look this cool. The whole scene's completely pre-rendered, of course, but still, it looked like 3D anime, which itself was still pretty new. All this technological change so quickly made the early 21st century, at least for a short while, an exciting time to be alive. Now, Orphan wasn't too good, and neither was Eternal Ring. But back then, even playing a bad game on the PS2 could still feel revolutionary. The bar was that low, because the technology was that new. Eternal Ring was actually made by a developer that you've probably heard of, From Software. It was a first-person RPG with a really involved ring crafting system, so in some ways, Eternal Ring felt like more of a CRPG, and that's part of what made it feel kind of special to play. The PS2 made it seem like the console and PC divide was narrowing without console games losing what made them unique. Now, were there flaws? Of course there were. Once online gaming became more feasible on consoles like Xbox, the PS2 nor Sony could really keep up. Though the ambitious yet ultimately underwhelming Final Fantasy XI introduced things like cross-platform play, 
The badly needed infrastructure for running online applications just wasn't there for Sony like it was for Microsoft. And like any console, plenty of PS2 games just weren't that good. But for players of a certain generation, the PS2 represents a special kind of nostalgia. It debuted perhaps at the pinnacle of Japan's relevance in video games, a relevance it's unclear if they will ever regain. There was once a time when products from that country were seen in the West as inferior, cheaply made knockoffs of American goods. Nobody could say that about the PS2, even if, ironically, it did borrow from the design of a late Atari prototype, the Falcon 30 Microbox. While it was roughly half the price of other DVD players, for just a little while, nobody could touch the PS2 or match the excitement that surrounded it. It sounds silly today, but back then, we thought it was cool just the way that the PS2 could be placed laying down or standing upright, like the monolith from Stanley Kubrick's 2001. Though the DualShock 2 controller was basically identical to the PS1's, it can't be said that, given the fully 3D, more sophisticated nature of its games, the PS2 utilized controls the same. In PS1 games, the second analog stick was rarely used, and most games were honestly more playable on D-pad. The PS2 got more complex, more 3D. In later games like MGS3, whether you use the D-pad or the analog stick meant something completely different for gameplay. And while it would still take a while for more central game mechanics like driving and shooting to migrate to the L and R buttons, PS2 games used all of their controllers' buttons more so than the PS1. To us in the West, everyday language and abstract symbols are two completely different things. Our language, of course, uses words, not symbols. But in Japanese, symbols are part of written language. On the PlayStation controller, the circle resembles, for example, a path forward, the X, one closing off. This man, Taiyu Goto, designed both the original PlayStation controller and the look of the PS2. As he explained to Famitsu, the triangle represented direction or your head. Square was a piece of paper to stand for menus or documents. And in a decision that would confound Western gamers for years, the circle and X represented yes and no, or confirm and cancel. Goto explains in a promo interview with Sony that for the PS2, with its iconic slate black frame and gradient blue lettering, his design was guided by themes of space, the earth, and life. The console's design itself, in other words, was an artistic statement, like no console before. The PS2 symbolized the whole universe, the frailty of life, and our small speck of that life within it. These themes would of course be echoed by maybe the quintessential early PS2 title, Metal Gear Solid 2, ending as it does on an oceanic, humanist note. But even before starting a game like MGS2 or Tekken Tag, as soon as you turned the damn thing on, the PS2 felt like stepping into tomorrow, the future. And yes, I know how naive and silly this sounds, but it's true. The cascade of shapes and atmosphere that greeted you, the organic and lush ambient music that played over the firmware's home menu, the visualized spires representing save data and everything else, the, the PS2's own menus were almost like curated art spaces. It had function, but one totally linked to the beauty of its form. And that's a huge part of what made this machine special. The fall of 2001 brought several masterpieces onto the machine, from Grand Theft Auto 3 to Metal Gear Solid 2, Silent Hill 2, and Ico. Each of these games served not only as towering individual achievements, but proofs of concept for what the 21st century video game would look like. Back in July, Square's Final Fantasy X gave the world its first premier fully 3D cinematic JRPG. Meanwhile, GTA 3 pioneered the 3D open-world sandbox. MGS2 achieved what director Hideo Kojima dubbed the Hollywood game. And Team Silence Silent Hill 2 proved that for the first time, games could truly achieve compelling psychological horror and surrealism. Many more history-changing titles would follow. But following the overly ambitious and expensive PlayStation 3, combined with strides made in PC gaming, game consoles today are no longer as culturally significant as the PS2 had made them. But the types of games that are popular today 
mostly, are all built on the back of the PS2's revolution. Personally, I continue to be inspired by the PS2 even today. The name for my original video essay format, the EVE, is a direct nod to the PS2 and the contents of its DVD. The optimism and grandeur yet humility of the system's design philosophy is something that I strive to achieve in my own work. So, after 20 years, here's to what may be the single most important games console of all time, the PlayStation 2. Until next time, boss.